morning about legalism versus godliness. Okay, this is, uh, I guess, in some in some circles, a little bit of a hot topic. I, I uh, don't know that I've ever taught a message directly on it. We taught about it in general, but uh, uh, I want to preface this by saying the term legalism number one is not in your Bible, folks. Okay, so. Uh, I just bear that. It's not in your Bible, okay? What people mean by that can be all kinds of different ramifications, okay? But what is the difference between legalism and godliness? Well, let me share a few principles and then we'll try to dig into the word itself. Boundaries are a good thing, okay? Boundaries, rules, standards, God's Word teaches us about that. It teaches us all kinds of boundaries. In fact, we find what we call godly principles of right and wrong all throughout the Scripture. I was taught from a fairly young age there's trans-dispensational principles throughout the entire Word of God. When you think about it and you look at it, you know, you see the principles in Exodus 20 and we teach them the Ten Commandments and gives them to Moses and what have you. And then you get over there and you read nine of those Ten Commandments in Romans 13, you realize, whoa, those same principles way back over there in the Old Testament are still applicable today. It's still not good to kill somebody. Okay? Right and wrong and the principles of right and wrong isn't the same thing as what people call legalism. Okay? That's a man-made term. So please be careful when people start throwing it around all over the place. Okay? You want to find out what, what the difference is in between a godly principle and what the world calls, or even the Christians call sometimes, legalism. Okay? Let's look at a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This verse has been touched on at least once, maybe twice this week. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, and so forth. There is a doctrine according to godliness. There really is. I mean, think about it. What's the doctrine for if it's not about understanding, conforming yourself to the image of the Son, and so forth? It's, it's something to be literally Christ-like in your life and not to glorify yourself. It's not done in the energy of our flesh. It's done through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. But there is such a thing called godliness. And what that looks like in your life, as you figure that out as an individual, like my dad said, we're all individually responsible for what we do in our bodies as a Christian. And we're going to be judged according to the things, whether they be good or bad. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 11. Look at those verses. Okay. So the idea that we need to understand the differences between godliness and maybe what someone else says is a legalism type thing. Is it an important factor because your Bible does talk about godliness, okay? But what does the Bible talk about legalism? Or what, what is a, I mean, it doesn't say anything about legalism. But uh, there's a verse over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 I want to share with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number 
or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. I see that principle as what, if I was to uh, go with the idea of legalism and think it has some valid points, okay, this would be a verse that I would go to and say, okay, here is a principle in the Word of God that tells me that I can't compare myself by myself or compare myself to somebody else. It says that's not a good idea, all right? Having said that, does that mean that if, you know, my cousin Joe comes over and he shares something from the Word of God that he has gathered that he has changed his life about and he's doing some things differently in his life and he brings to me what he himself has chosen to put in his house as a standard where he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he, he, he feels so ardently about it. And by the way, we should feel ardently about what we believe in the Word of God. It should go from head knowledge to heart knowledge. It should develop your conscience, okay? Well, when that gentleman comes over and seeks to speak the truth in love and share that information for the benefit of edification or maybe even to restore a brother who is erring, okay? That is not legalism, folks, okay? That's not being judgmental, okay? Um, like we mentioned last night, the passage in 1 Corinthians 6 talks about, guys, we're going to judge angels. Okay? Who are we not to be able to judge the things that pertain to this life? Read that passage in 1 Corinthians 6. And if you don't understand it, read it some more. They couldn't even, they didn't have a wise man among them that would discern the basics of life. They were babies. That's not what we're supposed to be. The Corinthians were babies. The Galatians were little children, right? You get over to Thessalonians, you might start finding out, wow, these guys, you know, they sounded out the word to all the regions of Achaia. They had some things going on. They were moving and doing, right? There's a difference between legalism and godliness. Does the Bible teach that we're not to make up standards? And by the way, I want to share this with you. The weaknesses that I have in my flesh, in Barney's flesh, may not always be the exact same weaknesses or the exact same levels of weakness in you. Okay? You might not like music. You might not like, see what I'm saying? It just may not be the same weaknesses. For me, I love music, okay? But for me, I've learned that I don't saturate my mind with music that isn't going to edify me or build me up. Because if the words are saying, more loving, hurt, cheap, flirt, drinking, lying, laughing, crying songs, it ain't doing Barney no good. I don't need to think like that. I've got a wife at home to go back to. I don't need to hear about somebody crying and whining and complaining about it because a girl left him. I don't need to hear that joke. Okay? The, the, the honorable role of marriage applies there. Do I want to sit and listen? No, I don't, it it's not going to benefit me. In fact, it may harm me. Okay? So, for me, where I'm at in my life, and because of what I personally have learned in my life, folks, because I've been there, okay? Speaking from experience, not just off the top of my hat, I've seen people who chase the neon rainbow, okay? I've seen people that want that use the pride in their voice. I have three off your brain. Well, so do I. But you know, God gives you that talent to glorify Him. Amen. Not to go out and sing unchained melody or whatever it is, okay? So for me, I've made decisions because I know that if I'm going to serve God in my life, going to have to make some decisions. I'm going to have to draw some lines in sand that say, you know what? That is unproductive for me. Because I know that I want to serve God in my life. Okay? And then my friend calls me up, my acquaintance calls me up and says, hey, 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 we're going to go down to the bowling alley. They karaoke down there and, and there's not too much beer. And you can come down there and we can sit and do some karaoke and 
I done did that, folks. It didn't work. Okay? Not only did it not work, but it caused me all kinds of problems. The, the, the people that hang out in those places are there for a different kind of fellowship than what I need. Okay? I need the one another into the body of Christ. I don't need the, woe is me, give me another beer. I didn't like to talk. My wife left me last night. Okay? I don't need to hear that. What are you looking for? What kind of fellowship are you looking for? Oh, oh, oh. You mean you can't be around that stuff. You're a legalist. What if you're pursuing godliness in your life? Can't you see the difference? I'm not talking about making up a man-made standard. But you know what? You are people. And you will make decisions in your life that either glorify God or they glorify your flesh. And by the way, there's only two wills in this universe that make any sense to anything. God's will and Satan's will. We might think that we came up with an original idea that just satisfies our flesh. You know what that satisfies? That satisfies Satan's will, folks. That's what he's got going on. Okay? It's not about you. Your life is not about you. I know that's a hard, hard thing to swallow, but you're just a vessel. And you're either going to be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. There ain't no neutral ground. Nothing ever runs anywhere, anyhow, in neutral. Anybody knows anything about cars knows that. You put a car, take a car out of the park and put it in neutral, see how far you can get. It don't work. I mean, the forward indicators are a little off. You've got to go one more sometime, but anyway. But there's a difference between legalism and godliness. Now, do I recognize that we often compare ourselves among ourselves? Yeah! I've been there. I, I, I'm looking at it, I'm like, how can they do that? You know? But I'm learning that, number one, I need to know whether or not they know the information that should cause them to react differently. And your parents know this, so I'm going to share this as a principle. When your child knows that you told them no, and you know they know you told them no, you can hold them accountable, right? But when the child is just learning what no means, and the child is just learning what, for them, is the absolute in their life as, a, as your parent, right? And you're not really sure whether they're being willful and fighting and struggling, okay? You can't, you can't take them out back and swap their bottom and cause a little pain until they learn what no means. Until you know yourself, you have to develop that confidence in that young child. By the way, the, I want to, commercial break, I want to thank the guys that did teach up here for, for being able to do so with the nursery in the same building that we have it. It's, it's, it's kind of a dynamic we've never done before. It's difficult. But we did this because we wanted the people who had children because we believe in families, okay? The family is a picture of, of, of the church. The marriage is a picture of Christ and the church, okay? And we advocate that here, okay? We advocate uh, parents learning to be responsible and raising their kids and to honor God. And like I said many times, there's people that look over, and I've done this, okay, that look over at somebody else's family and they notice that they don't do things like everybody hooks, you know. Well, first and foremost, all you really need to do is look up Titus 2, 11 through 15, and it says that you're to be willing to be peculiar, right? <laughs> Why do we all have to be exactly the same anyway? Now, having said that, there's always a threat. In the pride of your flesh and my flesh, that I'm an individual, I'm independent, I stand on my own two feet. That's just as wrong as the other side, okay? The reason you conform to something else is for the good of what is being done right. I'm not telling you to compromise something that is your personal conviction. But if it makes you uncomfortable because you have to sit on an oak pew or because you have to inconvenience you what you personally like to do, maybe you should just do it for that reason too, okay? I'll never forget, I was at a conference here about, I don't know how many years ago, okay, quite a while ago. And the particular message 
I guess just it wasn't where I was at, okay? I, I wasn't getting a great deal out of the message. So I started writing notes, reading my Bible, looking at different stuff, and then I said, well, this guy's about time. It's like the sixth message today, okay? I'm really going through a whole lot of this stuff, and it's getting tiring, okay? In the energy of my flesh, I'm like, okay? So, but I'm taking notes. I'm trying to be productive while I'm there. And we end up, and I'm thinking, great, he's done, you know? And these two guys in front of me, one of them turns to the other one and goes, you know, that was great. <laughs> and I was like, did I miss something? And the other guy's like, yeah, he did this and that. And I listened to what they were saying. I was like, that just wasn't for me, but look what it did for them. Praise God. That's how edification works. Sometimes it's not where you're at. Maybe it's not what you need. Maybe I wanted orange juice today and I got milk. You know what I'm saying? But the point is, when you come together, it's not just for your benefit. It's not for just for my benefit that I'm standing up here acting like a fool, okay? But the point is, it's for the good of education. It's for the good of the people. It's because there's a process over there in Colossians 2, 6, and 7 where God told Paul to tell us that we're going to be rooted, builded, and established. That we're going to be, yes, conformed to the image of His Son. And what that looks like when we can get in the Word of God and make that happen. How the proving out of the will of God actually happens. We're not here on this planet to do nothing. And we're certainly not here on this planet to live my life. My way. Somebody brought that up. That's excellent. That's good stuff, right? We're not here to do it our way. We're bought with a price. Now, I don't need to tell you about that price, but maybe I could remind you about that price. God's only begotten Son was placed on the cross to pay, to pay for our dirty, rotten sins. And we need to realize that's the first part of the gospel. Is that good news? Well, at first it's not, because you've got to admit you're a dirty, rotten sinner. What's good about that? We're all sinners. We're all in the same boat. We're all born that way. But by the grace of God, God gave His only begotten Son. He put Him in the world, conceived in the Virgin Mary of the Holy Ghost. Perfect, only begotten Son of God to die on that cross for all of us. Everybody in the world. The payment was made once for all. He didn't do it wrong the first time, folks. He didn't need to do it again. It was finished when he got done. Okay? Do you believe that this morning? If you believe that this morning, and you believe it was really for you, because you know you're a sinner, you realize that, you know what? No matter what, I'm falling short of the glory of God. Me, Barney, and the energy of my flesh will do it wrong every time. Okay? And by the way, that includes whether you're an unbeliever or a believer. You will do it wrong in your flesh every time, no matter what. The only thing that ever glorifies God in your body is the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God living His life out of you. Okay? We don't work harder, try harder, you know, in the energy of our flesh. We yield, we reckon, we know, and we comprehend, and God works through us. Philippians 1, 6, He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. Now, we can prohibit that, unfortunately, because of our old man, right? Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, the renewed mind, folks, not my mind, my mind's still corrupt. With the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Don't ever think just because you're in the dispensation of the grace of God that sin is no longer an issue. How many people here quit sin in the day they got they got become a believer? How many people here quit sin? I didn't think so. I didn't either. I wish I wish it was that simple sometimes, but it's not. But you know what would have really glorified God if you didn't have to suffer? Trick question. <laughs> yeah, you know, who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Nothing gets done in this life without work. That's a toughie. You guys hear me hollering all the time around here trying to get something done. That's all I'm trying to do. Okay, because I realized a long time ago, nothing gets done without work. Okay? Way off my message. Let me see what I can skip here. 
We sometimes as humans compare ourselves among ourselves. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. But this concept of finding something that I know is an issue with me. Okay? And I get and I find the Word of God, the principles from the Word of God that teach right and wrong. And I go home and I discuss it with my loving wife. And we discuss what we do and do not do in our house. Okay? And then we go to the kids. And at a young age, you mandate that with your kids. And then you go through a transition time where, by the grace of God, and hopefully speaking the truth in love, you raise them up in the nurture and admonition of you. No, preacher! You raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay? Because God's against it, and so am I. Can you make them do something they don't want to do? Well, maybe when they're little, okay? Should you make something, make them do something that they don't want to do? Well, you better, because their flesh naturally prohibits growth in order to be less responsible to the truth, just like yours does, okay? That's where that character training stuff at the young age matters. That's why when, and I thank God, my sister and my brother-in-law helped teach us that when the child wants to do what it wants to do, have them sit still for a while. I'll share that with you young couples here. Take your child, I, I, there's varying ages and groups and children, I get that. Have them sit at home, start with 10 minutes, and have them sit still and read to them, where all they have to do is sit and listen. Don't give them a coloring book every time they start whining. Don't hand them your cell phone every time. I'm not talking about babies, I'm talking about as they grow, Quit giving them pacifiers, okay? Give them something that they actually have to stop, pay attention, and listen, okay? And I thank God now, for, I'll tell you this, real life experience, my father used to always say, listen! I mean, initially it kind of annoyed me, honestly. I'm 8, 10, 12, I don't know how old I was. But you know, the first thing I got with that Whatever's going on, my dad thinks it's important. And by the way, if the children in your life don't believe that you believe it's important, you think they're going to listen? I got that somehow. Listen. Finally, I started listening. First, it was more of a, okay, i got to be quiet because dad wants to hear it. Okay? I sit down and I'll be quiet. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, dad thinks this is really important. I don't know about you guys. i got to ask this question. This is a toughie here, okay? How many people ever got up and told their family, get up and we're leaving? Come on. Anybody at all? No, I don't care what the circumstances are. Okay? You're in a place and something's not right and your kids are at that age where they will be influenced. How many times have you guys ever had to say to your better half, your wife, your help me, Get up, we're leaving. I got two or three hands. Kid. Can I get a witness? No, I'm just kidding. I'm serious. You're the head of your home, folks. Take that, man, take that seriously. If you perceive something because of the discernment in your mind from God's infallible word that is ungodly, God created emotions in you to motivate you based upon the information that God's Word tells you. Do something about it. Be angry and sin not. Don't go beat the guy up, okay? <laughs> but do something about it. We, we live in a culture that constantly wants to have passive men. Okay? Stand up for something. You ever heard that old song, stand for something? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Well, we don't want, we don't want that way. God designed the man to, to be the leader. i got to share this with you. Guys, you'll never be able to have an honorable, loving relationship with your wife if you're looking at images that do not honor women. It's not going to happen. But when you look at your wife, like that guy over there in Song of Solomon, look at his wife. Okay? Proverbs 5.19, that young man, 
He looks at his wife and says, Let her be as a loving robe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Be thou ravished always with her love. That's what God wants in a covenant relationship of marriage. And by the way, that's ownership from both ways, guys. 1 Corinthians 7. She owns you and you own her. Okay? I love, I'm sorry, I love talking about marriage. Okay, relationships, marriage. But this thing of legalism and godliness, when you know what godliness looks like because you've been reading about it, you can make some pretty good discernments, okay? And that they're really not all that difficult if you just read the Bible and find out from God's Word what God expects of you. It's really simple to determine the things that are good or evil, like it says over there in Hebrews 5. But bear in mind, he says that they had their senses exercised to discern, judge, good or evil. Okay? So what do you do with that? I got all this information. Can I share with you this? This, this is the fun part for me. Um, once you get all that information and you know so much and you perceive some things, how do you go about affecting that to glorify God? Not to prove your point, but to glorify God. Number one, the, the principle of Galatians 6 always comes to mind. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, I think that's a personal Fault, okay. He's overtaken in it. If a brother be overtaken in a fault, just wait a while, he'll come around. Don't call him up. Don't bother him. No. Ye that are spiritual. Those guys that have that discernment to judge matters in life, the things that pertain to this life. And they see God's word. Paul's epistles is actually something that's, wow, the doctrine according to godliness. What are we going to do with this? So-and-so's living in sin. He's coming to our assembly. He's putting in his time. He's showing up at the hour, hour and a half on Sunday morning anyway. Okay? What are you going to do? Can I share you? You've got to love him enough. But you've got to love the truth enough. Not the compromise. Ye that are spiritual, restore such a one, considering thyself, which, lest thou also be tempted. Go to him in the spirit of meekness. Don't go over there and drag him out of his house, bend him over, you know, that. you know, that's not our job. It wouldn't change his heart anyway. In most cases, here's some strange things, but in most cases that doesn't work, okay? Legalism and godliness. With comparing yourself to somebody else, okay? It's not wise. That's what legalism. The root, the root of any problem is we're humans. We have flesh. Okay? We might know more than someone else. Then how can you take the truth of God's word? The same truth over there in John 8 32, it says the truth will what? Set you free! Well, do we want to be free? Well, I thought I was free to begin with. There's no such thing in your Bible in relationship to salvation as free will. Okay? Study that out. It's just a pet peeve of mine, if you would. I got a warning, you know, probably. But my point is, is your will as an unbeliever is in bondage to serve Satan. Okay? Nothing free about that guy. The only freedom you have is the freedom that you get when you're in Christ. So if you want, as a, by the way, if you're in Christ and yet you want to live some other way, what do you think that produces? Bondage. That's not who you are anymore. Your life is hid with Christ in God. You're nothing but a vessel. But you need to be sanctified and meet for the master of use. 
So how do you deal with that? When you're looking at that and, and you're thinking, well, so-and-so over there says that in their house they do this and this and this, and he talked to me about this, and, and it worked. He thought it was working pretty good with his kids, and, and, and he came over and he discussed it with me, and he tried to teach me the principle of how to work with his kids. Well, does it work with ours? Well, the principle's there, but our kids are a little different. This guy's got this issue. This guy's got this issue. Okay, every kid's different. But the principle is godly. And you can see the fruit coming out of it. And you're like, well, something there's right. Maybe they didn't do it all right. They're human too, right? But the principle is the issue. Are you going to live your life on a whim? Or worse yet, are you going to live your life on your opinions? And your preferences? Or some other scholar's preferences? Or knowledge, man's wisdom, philosophy, humanism. There's all kinds of stuff out there that you need to know about, okay? In order not to get sucked into it. You are a Christian if you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection on the cross for your sins. Okay? Christ didn't die on the cross for your sins. Be buried and rose again for your justification. So you can live however you want to live. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> what motivates the Christian? What motivates the Christian in, in, in this crazy life that we live in? By the way, you are in a realm here where Satan is the God of this world. Know that. 2 Corinthians teaches that principle. Satan is the god of this world. Okay, Little g, by the way. He's little g. Satan is the god of this world. You need to know that. Over there in 2 Timothy 2, what does it say? You can be taken captive by him at his will. What do you think we talked about Satan's will off and on all week for? As a Christian, you can be taken captive by Satan at his will. That doesn't mean that Satan's will works differently than God's will. Satan's over here mm, jerking on you. Mm. Well, that, that's not how it works. Well, some people think God's will works like that too. Well, God's over here changing all these circumstances to make it more difficult or easier for you, whichever you believe, okay? That's not how it works. God works through the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit through the word that he left here for us, okay? Satan works through all of those wiles out there. And by the way, there's many more of those that pertain to your senses, right? Touch, taste, feel, hear, smell, all those things. I, can't, I never get those right, okay? Probably miss the smell. That's an issue as well. But what I'm sharing with you is those two wills go in two different directions, folks. Satan is out there with all of those things that he bombards you with. Can I share you 50 years ago, it was more difficult to get the kind of garbage in your house that you say, or my door says on the front of it, thanks to Dawson's handiwork of wood. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can put that on the front door and allow something to come in right there on the screen that doesn't glorify God. Not a good option, folks. My wife has passwords on all of our computers. Oh, well, you're a legalist. I'm just sharing with you what we do at my house. If you think for some oddball reason that you don't, in the, in, in the depths and the darkness of your sinful flesh, that you have no problem with temptations of the flesh, you're either a liar or you're just really gullible. One of the two, okay? I know what my problems were. Maybe they aren't to your level. Maybe for some reason you just don't find women appealing. I scary to me, but hey, that, maybe you're just not that way. I personally believe it's pretty much every man's battle. I get those guys right there. I think that's right. So if you make that decision, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Can I share with you on a very personal level, it isn't going to do any good as a father, as a husband, to make that decision for your family and let you own it first. Any, any gritty guy can tell somebody what to do. Any guy with character or grit or intestinal fortitude, my dad used to call it, 
Okay, you can always tell somebody else what to do. The hardest thing a man will ever do is tell himself no. Is to get on his knees before his wife and tell his wife, dear, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I know I shouldn't have been looking at that. But it'll change your life. God designed the marriage to be a beautiful one. Don't let Satan's will get in the middle of God's will and make your marriage a dishonorable thing because you didn't do it right. But you make that decision for yourself first as a man. Between you and God. Who's your head, guys? 1 Corinthians 11. Christ is your head. Right? Commercial break. The Ephesians 5, 21 and 22 are in two different things going on. You got the context of, go to there. I preached this off the top of my head. Ephesians chapter 5. This I just mentioned this to somebody in between messages. I was at a uh, I don't know who, whose house I was at. It's kind of irrelevant. I was at a good Baptist friend's mom's house, okay? And they had this game going on, uh, some kind of Bible trivia that they had on the computer or a TV screen or something. And the screen was up. And I was paying about half the attention. And this thing came up and it says, what verse in your Bible tells the man to submit to his wife? And I was like half paying attention. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop. Hit pause. What's going on? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, it says, what verse in your Bible tells the man to submit to his wife? I said, can you show me what verse they come up with as the answer so we can look at this? I had to be really tactful. I'm sitting in somebody's house. I mean, I'm trying to be somewhat tactful about it. Not like here. But anyway, Ephesians 5. How many people have a Schofield Bible? Quite a few of you. I, I have a Schofield as well. Go up to verse 15 or so. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Do you think this is talking about marriage in this context? It don't seem like it, does it? Let's keep reading. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I think it's talking to believers as the body of Christ so far. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stop. What punctuation comes after that? Hello. You can talk to. What, what punctuation comes after that? Thank you. Does a semicolon mean that the thought process is stopped there? I don't think so. Okay, we need a period to know that, right? Okay, for those folks that have a Schofield, what does it say right above verse twenty-one? Come on, tell me. The married life of the spirit-filled believers. Schofield starts the marriage life of the believer in verse 21. Look at this. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, and there's a period there, folks, which wasn't in the prior verse. Do you think verse 21 is talking about the context of marriage life? Or do you think verse 21 is talking about the life of the body of Christ? how we are to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. Okay? And I tell you, that's a big difference. Big difference. Okay? You need to be able to see those things when they come out. Having said that, and you can go over to 1 Corinthians 11, you can go back to Genesis, and you can teach the order of the home. Thomas Dibble's already done that. But my point is that uh, the role of the, the woman has been dragged through muck Meyer due to a bad cultural example of what a woman they think is supposed to look like, okay? The woman's role as a mother, as a wife, is a beautiful thing, okay? 
Proverbs 31 teaches all kinds of stuff. I mean, read the whole thing. Proverbs 31 teaches. She's out there buying fields, obviously real estate or whatever, but she perceives and she makes decisions, okay? But she's also making linen for her household and feeding them and taking care of them. And she's got a hand out to the needy. I mean, she's, she's a worker, okay? And I don't understand this sitting in the gate things entirely. It had to do with the eldership and, and, and a, uh, some kind of seniority role in, in these towns that they had. But her husband is sitting in the gates. But what's he doing? He's praising her in the gates. That's awesome, guys. I mean, it sounds cheesy, but when I'm sitting there at the break table at Walmart of all places, and I open my lunchbox, and I'm trying to find out what's in there, and there's all kinds of stuff in there, okay? People look at me, don't you pack your own lunch? I'm like, no, most of the time I'm not packs my lunch. And they're like, wow, you know. And then one day I show up and I got this huge container with different levels of dessert in there. And they're like, <laughs> you know, I get, especially from the guys, I'm like, oh, I don't know. you got any more of that, you know. But my wife loves me. I love my wife. But you know what? Do you know what's even better than that, guys? For you single guys out there, you know what's even more beautiful than the fact that I love my wife and my wife loves me? You know what's even more beautiful than that? We both love God. Okay? When my love fails, and it does sometimes, when Barney's love is selfish, he wants to do what he wants to do. If you don't have the love of Christ in you, she doesn't have the love of Christ in her. Temporarily, at least, your, your relationship can really go through some tough times. But if you as an individual already made that decision in your life, you know what? I want to serve God. And I don't matter what you're doing and how you're doing that. It doesn't matter whether you're a plumber, a construction worker, a mower. I don't care what you're doing in life, but you've made a decision in your life the depths of your heart, between you, your relationship with an almighty God, you made a decision that you were going to love God, that you were going to reciprocate that love toward God, to them that love God to those who are the call according to His purpose, right? See, our love is a real thing, by the way, as humans. God recognizes it as a good thing in the proper context, right? God made you to be able to love and care and have feelings. That's not a bad thing in and of itself. Now, it can be a bad thing. We know this. Jeremiah 17, 9, it tells us the heart is deceitful. Well, the heart is the, the, the seat of your emotions. He says the heart is deceitful. Above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know? Uh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. That's the most common excuse in the book. Well, I went out there with her and I got, I didn't know what I was doing. I've had guys tell me, well, I didn't really go that far. I was kind of joking. Can I tell you, if you know anything as a man, quit making excuses for your own ineptitude. Quit making excuses for making a bad decision and own up to it. If it means you get on your knees and wear holes in your pants because you're crying before an almighty God to make you a godly man, then do it. Christ is your head. Get honest about it. Deal with it. Quit making excuses. I think God and my dad taught me quit making excuses. Don't make excuses. Legalism and godliness, because I'm like way off topic here. Let me see what I can get rid of here. 2 Corinthians 5. You need to read that whenever you read it. I'll try to wrap this up. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5. Notice it's not our love that constrains us. It's the love of Christ. Okay. Over there in Ephesians 3, I'm not going to go there. Ephesians 3, 17, it says we can know the love of Christ. You need to know about the love of Christ. You need to comprehend some things in your life. Your Christian life, whether well, Jordan said this for 35 years, your Christian life will not operate on the basis of ignorance. Okay? 
2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. Whoa, whoa, judge. It said it right there, didn't it? Whoa. That's a good word, folks. It's a good biblical word. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We ain't here to do whatever we want to do, folks. We're just not. If that's a news flash to you, I can't apologize for it because the Bible says it. We're not here to do whatever we want to do. Godliness is an issue. It's an issue of God. You ever ask yourself this? I, I told a message on this a while back. Does God care about what I care about? Does God care about what I think about? Does God care what I do? Well, yeah. You are a child of God. You're His child. Do you care about your child? Well, it's kind of a dumb question when you think about if your Heavenly Father cares about you. Of course he does. And we need to learn that. We need to learn about the things that he has actually given us. Empowered us. So that we can do some things. Okay? We need to learn about those things. I've got to finish this somehow here. Let's see here. Go to Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Reference Ephesians 3, write this in your notes if you're taking notes. Ephesians 3, 16 through 20. And I've got to read it to you. Hold on. Because I'm going to misquote it because I'm tired. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Just stay in Philippians if you would. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. When you realize in your life, you don't have to do it anymore. But it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But you don't do it. Okay? The power of the Spirit of God does it in your life. That's why God gets the glory. Okay? Ephesians 3, 16, where it says we're to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, right? You guys, you know, when you think about those decisions and you think about all those difficulties in life, you're like, but how can I have that power to make that decision? How do I know what to do? Where do I get that power? What does 1 Corinthians 1, 18 say? For the preaching of of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. It's the power of God. The gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and all that that entails through Romans through Philemon teaches you to be equipped to be actually understand what the power of God can do in the life of the believer. Is it any wonder why Satan fights it so much? He doesn't want you to become effective. He doesn't want you to find out what that power is. Okay? I don't know about you, but they talk about Jeremiah said it was a fire in his bones. I get that. Billy, I know Billy gets it. Okay? Go to Philippians <coughs> chapter 3 if you're not already there. <clears throat> this thing about knowing Christ. Look at this. That I may know Him. By the way, stop right there. Are we in the business of trying to figure out who I am? Are we in the business of trying to know ourselves? That is what I'm talking about. There's a whole school of thought out there that knows, well, he's just trying to find out who he is. You don't even need to know that. All you are is a vessel. But you need to know where you're floating to in that vessel. Okay? Are you going to be sanctified and meet for the master of use? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. 
that thing that Larry was talking about. The resurrection. Christ, the, the huge stone that it took numerous soldiers to roll across, it's gone. And they go in and they look in there and then whoever that apostle is that beats Peter, that's really flighty on his feet, but we don't know who he is because he doesn't say. He gets there and he sticks his head in and waits for Peter. Peter comes in, goes right in. He's the chief apostle. He's not waiting around. Same guy that had to pull the pulled sword out. Whack! Just cut that guy's ear right off. And he's like, oh, you know. Okay? But those guys get there and they look in there and they see everything. It's still mummified. It's still laying in there. The head, what? He's gone! God did that! God raised Christ from the dead. God said, this is my beloved son and my well pleased. Okay? That is the resurrection power of God. And you as a Christian can access that resurrection power. You're like, what? Yeah, that's what it says. That's what the ministry of the Holy Spirit can do in the life of the believer. And when you start getting a hold of that, when you get over there and you read and you study for yourself as an individual, Romans 6 through 8, and you start realizing that the latter part of Romans 7, the beginning of Romans 8, is literally talking about when you're living your life of sin and debauchery in your flesh, you're going to feel bad because that's not who you are anymore. But it's not like Christ. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise God. That'll, be, that'll, that'll change, make some changes in your life. I gotta calm down. Okay. Should have done in jumping jacks outside. Pulled me up or something. But I have been waiting four or five days. I haven't said a whole lot. So anyway, put me three, let's finish this out. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Nothing gets done in life without work, folks. Being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that through which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. If you're living your life in the tyranny of your emotions because of something you did in your past, lay it at the foot of the cross, folks. You will never be any good to anybody else, either an unbeliever or somebody in the body of Christ that actually cares about you or your family members if you're living your life in the tyranny of your bad decisions in your past. Christ paid the price for those sins. Quit dragging them on through your life. What are you doing? Lay them at the foot of the cross. Move on. Forgetting those things which are behind. Reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Are you perfect in Christ? Are you complete in Christ? Yeah. Not because of anything you did or anything you're going to do. You're complete in Christ. Now having said that, bear this in mind, this is touchy. I personally believe you can be complete and not conformed. Okay? Study that out on the basis of Caleb's information prior and so forth. That sounds sketchy at first, so bear with me. I believe you can be complete in Christ, but not conform to the image of His Son. The principles of Galatians 4, 6, and 19. Paul looks at him and he says to them, Galatians, My little children. Now, he just got to call them sons earlier in the chapter. But now he's calling them children. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, Right? Until Christ be formed in you. Christ was already in them. The ministry of the Holy Spirit was already in them. But what was going on there? They weren't being transformed by the renewed mind. They were not being conformed to the image of His Son. And what did the Son do? He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Right? He said, I'm here to do the Father's will. Right? Well, that's our job. Think about that for two seconds here. The Holy Begotten Son of God was here in the flesh 
to do the Father's will. He did it. And when he left, he said, it is finished, right? But what are we called? Who are we? We're the body of Christ. Who's the head of the body? Now, by the way, bodies don't run around without heads. I mean, if you're a chicken, you'll have a little while, right? But the point is, the body doesn't run around without a head. Christ is our head. Then who, whose thinking process do you use when you operate as a member of the body of Christ? Christ. Philippians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. If you don't know where those are at, look them up. We have the mind of Christ, which I personally believe is this, okay? Everything that God gave us to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, inspiration, and preservation, this is here. You guys, when we, when it says we're to comprehend, to know, to learn Christ, to grow up into Christ, and those kinds of things. That is the thing that will actually cause you because of your own personal convictions to make those weird decisions in your life that maybe some people do think is legalism, okay? Maybe your, your standards are different than somebody else's because you chose to make a decision that to them looks a little weird. I'll share one with you real quick. When I was a kid, my dad and mom, they would say they didn't believe in mixed babies. I mean, everybody's like, what's that talking about? Nobody gets in the same tub that we're talking about. He literally was, they literally were talking about choosing to put a baby suit on and go swimming, okay? Because of the level of skin exposure in most bathing suits, okay? They chose not to do that for us. So they taught us, by way of principle, if you're going to try to uh, go swimming to enjoy just the water, somehow you're going to have to put more clothes on. Okay? And we try to do that with our kids as well. And to share with them the concepts of modest apparel. Not because we were trying to condemn them in their flesh, per se, but because we wanted in the future their spouses to be able to enjoy that honorable role in marriage. Okay? The goal is not to condemn people. The goal is to live outside of the tyranny of shame that comes with all of that, okay? You develop those convictions in your own home as you grow in God's Word and give God the glory, okay? I'm just sharing with you some real-life experiences that I've been through, okay? But that power that we have to access those things is important, okay? We need to be able to get in God's Word. And just, I don't know how you guys study, but the way I look for stuff like this, if I want to study about a particular topic, I get a Bible, a notebook, a pen, and a concordance out, and I look up that word that I'm looking for about that topic. And, uh, and try not to write down a whole lot until I've actually studied it, okay? Because I have you know, preconceived notions in my head and so forth. So... The difference between legalism and godliness? Well, we know we're not to compare ourselves among ourselves, okay? But what is the standard that we are to work our life off of if it's not each other? What is the standard? God's Word, folks. Does God's Word say anything about modesty? Does God's Word say anything about how the attire of a harlot was a problem, how her attitude was imputed, and that, that gal over there in 2 Timothy 2, it says she was she had shamefacedness. The opposite of imputed. See that? Those are just principles, folks, which you need to know them in order to be able to pertain and make good discernments in your own life. Legalism and godliness is a very touchy thing. It's a hard thing to teach. I, I, I would say... One of the easiest ways to discern between the two is first know what the Bible says about the topic, whatever it is. And if you don't know, get in the Word of God. Look it up. Does God's Word say anything about wine? It says a lot, by the way. Good and bad, depending on a lot of things. Okay. And what does God's Word say <clears throat> about smoking? Well, nothing directly, but there's principles that you can follow through. Okay. What does God's Word say about 
tattoos and you know silly stuff like that. But my point is, to make a long story short, if you believe you're bought with a price and you glorify God in your body and you take that seriously in your life, it'll change your life. And God's Word through the ministry of the Holy Spirit will cause you to make some decisions in your life that may appear legalistic. Okay? I'm not advocating writing down standards and then mandating those standards to someone else who doesn't even understand the principle. Doesn't mean you don't talk about the principle, though, okay? Because people can look like that. That's the one another in the body of Christ. So there is a difference between legalism, man made term legalism, and godliness. And we need to be able to discern between those things so that we can be productive with teaching people the truth in love that help them grow up, okay? Hopefully that was helpful. I know I ran and raved a lot, but I've been waiting all for a few days to speak. Probably should have spoke earlier in the week, too. But anyway, let's close with prayer. Do it, Jesus. Thank you for all you've given us. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us the infallible truths that we know. When we go and read from your word the principles of godliness and learn to literally apply those to our lives that sound doctrine that actually becomes the doctrine according to godliness. Thank you for those things and the opportunities that responsible grace teaches us. And uh, help us to enjoy those things and, and, and rebel in those, enjoy those, and be thankful in those things. And not try to make a legalistic, man-made standard out of it. But enjoy the godliness that you have provided for us to live in. In the name we pray. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead.